Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. So I had to share with you guys this dream that I just had the other night. Now, leading up to this dream over the course of last week, I had been really just crying out to God and really just seeking him and asking him to show me what he wants me to be doing right now. You know, what he wants me to be focusing on with this channel, um, what he wants me to be telling people. Um, I was just asking him to lead and guide me, you know, in making videos. And I don't ever want to sit here and make videos that I know are going to get views. But I want to make videos that are going to be pleasing to the Lord. They're going to point you in the direction of Christ. And I want to speak upon things that the Lord has truly given me and not things that are just coming from me. So this is a few nights ago. I prayed before I went to bed, you know, and it was just kind of after a long week of asking the Lord these things. And I said, God, like, you know, I'm not worthy to hear from you like I'm not but if there was something that you would have me tell your people like what would it be you know and so I went to sleep and a few hours after falling asleep I started having this dream now in the dream I was praying to the Lord and I asked him very specifically I said Lord if the rapture is coming in two hours what would you have me tell people and he spoke to me and he said, tell them to repent. Now, when he said, tell them to repent, he didn't have to tell me, but I could feel it in his voice. You know, it's almost like he told me without telling me because I could hear it and I could feel it in his voice. When he said, tell them to repent, I could feel his hatred towards sin. And I could feel how angry he was with the state of the world right now, not only with the non-believer, but also with the believer, right? There is a lack of repentance and there is a big shifting of focus away from him and onto other things that don't matter. So after he told me this, I said, okay. And I started gathering people and I started gathering believers and non-believers. I started gathering them all. And my father was with me too, right? My, my earthly father was with me. And as I'm gathering these people, we start coming under opposition and we start coming under attack by an outside group, right? Like an outside force of people. Now, I don't know who these people were. I don't know why they were after us. All I know is these people were after us, right? So these people are coming after us and I'm trying to gather as many people as I can. And I was going to bring them to this location that I know was safe, right? I knew this location was safe. And so as I'm gathering these people, I start shifting my focus because I start taking my eyes off the Lord and I start focusing on them, right? I start focusing on this group that's coming after us. And so I start gathering weapons, right? I start gathering weapons and supplies and I'm thinking, okay, this is how we're going to defend ourselves. These guys are coming. I'm going to grab this and this and we're going to protect ourselves. And my dad in the dream, he looks at me and he says, what are you doing? He said, that's pointless. He said, that's useless. Right? He said, let's go. And I said, yeah, you're right. You know, and so I kept gathering those people because people started scattering in the dream. Once I started gathering resources and weapons, the people that I had been gathering, they started to scatter, right? And they started to panic too. So once I took my eyes back off of the resources and the weapons that I was trying to gather and gathering the people again, I was able to start gathering these people again and we were headed back into the direction we needed to go. Now, I believe the reason that God used my dad in the dream is because he is someone who I look up to uh, spiritually. And he's someone that I look up to in high regard as far as how he lives his Christian life, right? And his walk with the Lord. Because my dad, my entire life has been a example of a godly man. The way he's led our family, um, the way he's raised me, the actions that he's taken and the obedience that he's had towards the Lord. He's a true man of God. Right? He's a true man of God, and he really puts his life on the line for the Lord. So when my dad in the dream told me to stop focusing on these things, he said it's useless, it's pointless, it really showed me that whatever is coming upon us, you know, while we're still here on earth, our focus should not be on that and how we're going to prepare for that and how we're going to protect ourselves from that. Right? Our focus should be on the Lord and following him and seeking him right? and obeying him. Because he's the one that's going to lead the way through this time. He's the one that's going to provide everything we, we need. There's nothing that we're going to be able to do that's going to prepare. We're going to come under opposition, right, from outside forces. But it's going to be through him that we will find what we need. Now, what I really want to focus on right now, though, is what the Lord told me in the dream. 
when I asked him, Lord, like if there's two hours left before the rapture, what should I tell people? And he said, tell them to repent. Right? And I know he was talking to the non-believer, number one, as we need to be telling the non-believer to repent. Right? We need to be leading them towards Christ. That's what we should be spending our time doing right now. But he also said it to the believer, right? The believer, we need to repent. Right now, when I woke up from this dream, like I said, I could feel how angry the Lord was towards sin, how much he hated sin. And let's get this clear. God loves you, but he hates your sin, right? And he hates sin so much, right? It's detestable towards the Lord. And so when I woke up from this dream, like I couldn't go back to sleep. I immediately got into prayer and I just started repenting. Like there's certain things in my life that I know that like I haven't been living 100% for the Lord in. And there's things I know in my life that haven't been right. And so immediately I start repenting, you know, immediately. And it was just a deep, sorrowful repentance. And it was just one of the most sincere prayers that I've ever had between me and the Lord was just this broken heart over my sin and broken heart over the ways that I know I need to be living better for him. And a lot of that comes through just witnessing for him. Right, taking every opportunity I have, being a godly example to people around me in my workplace and things like that. And so I wanted to look today at repentance too, because a lot of people are like, well, what, what is repentance, right? Some churches don't even teach repentance. And uh, repentance is a crucial, vital part of Christianity. Now, repentance is a change of mind or action towards something that you have done, right? It's remorse over actions that you have taken or the lifestyle that you've been living. And it's a change of mind. It's a decision to no longer live that way, right? No longer give into those same things that you were giving into, no longer living your life in a certain way, but instead turning in a different direction, right? That is true repentance. And as Christians, we can't just go on living in sin and just apologizing to God for it all the time and just being like, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Like, you know, I'm sorry. Sorry, Lord. And then continue on doing whatever you want because we are saved by grace, right? Through faith alone. But a lot of times people will abuse grace and use it to keep on sinning because they know that they're forgiven, right? So what do they do? Oh, well, I'm forgiven anyway. You know, I'm going to heaven anyway because, you know, God's forgiven me anyway. So I'm just gonna, it's whatever, you know? Like God still loves me. But a true Christian heart will always have repentance. So let's look at what Jesus said in Mark 1 verse 15, which says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So in Jesus' own words, he says, repent and believe in the gospel. Right? It's not enough to just believe, oh, you know, yeah, Jesus did come to earth. He was the son of God. Like he did die and he rose again. Right? Satan believes that. The demons believe that. Other religions believe that Jesus was real. Right? They might not believe that he was the son of God. They might not believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But other religions believe in Jesus. Right? But Jesus himself said the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? Eternity is at hand. So repent and believe in the gospel. Right? And Peter reconfirms this in Acts 2.38 where he says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter reaffirms there, you know, repent and believe in Jesus, right? Be baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, right? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we know the Holy Spirit comes at the moment of salvation, right? It's not a separate event from salvation. So we see here it's repentance and belief, which leads to salvation. And that's what it means to put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, right? If you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord, right? It's faith through grace is how we're saved, Faith means you believe that what Jesus said is true. And Jesus himself says, repent of your sins, right? Repent of your sins and believe in me. Now, I am a believer in once saved, always saved. But I believe once genuinely saved, always saved. And I believe that there's a lot of people that use what we call hyper grace, where they preach once saved, always saved, right? But they don't preach repentance. They don't preach obedience. It's just this easy beliefism that will lead you straight to hell. Right? So we see in Romans 6, verse 1 through 2, which says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So Paul is saying there, you know, we're saved by grace. Like we have security of salvation. But does that mean that we should go on sinning because we have the security? Right? Because we are saved by grace and not by works? He says, absolutely not. He says, how can you continue to live in sin if you're in Christ? 
right? If you're a true, genuine believer in Christ Jesus, if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, there will always be conviction, there will always be repentance, and the Holy Spirit will bear fruits in your life that lead you to becoming more Christ-like, right? Which will lead you away from sin. There is no easy beliefism here. There is no, well, I'm saved by grace, and so, you know, Jesus came to free me from the law. He didn't come to free you from the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law, right? Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the other laws of Moses, so we could go to heaven because we can't fulfill those. But that doesn't mean that Jesus says, you don't have to obey those laws anymore, right? It's okay because I did it for you. You can just go on living however you want, and all you have to do is believe in me because you're saved by grace. That's not how it works, okay? Jesus came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to free you from it. If we didn't have the law, we wouldn't know what sin is. We wouldn't know the difference between right and wrong, okay? We choose to be more Christ-like, right? We desire to be more Christ-like, and to be more Christ-like means to try and fulfill the law because that's what he did. We know we can't, right? But we desire to, this is reaffirmed in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, which says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. So the true sign of someone that loves the Lord, right? The true sign of someone that follows Jesus is they hate their sin, right? And God makes you increasingly aware of your shortcomings. He makes you increasingly aware of your sin as a believer, right? He wants to bring it to the surface so that we can see it, we can repent, and he can change us. Right? We can choose obedience. And there's so many things in my life that I didn't know were sinful and just filthy until God brought them to the surface. And listen, we will never be perfect here on earth. right? We will always struggle with some sort of sin. But there'll be this constant progression of sanctification towards being more Christ-like. right? That's that process of sanctification is you becoming more Christ-like through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, We see this in 1 John 2 verse 1 which says, My little children, these things I write to you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So John is saying here, you know, I'm writing these things to you so that you won't continue on in sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ. Right? Who through him we have forgiveness of the Father. And the Bible says that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all things. Right? But if you truly love Jesus, right, you will choose to not sin. Right? You may struggle with it sometimes, you may fail here and there, but you will hate those failures, right? And it will cause repentance in your heart. Like as a true Christian, when you really think about how sinful you are, when you really think about how far you fall from where you want to be and where you need to be in order to go to heaven and what Jesus did on the cross for your sins, right? How he took the punishment for your sins, how he was beaten, broken, bruised, battered, spit upon, tortured for you, right? And what you really deserve, that should break your heart, right? That should break your heart so much that it should cause you to love Christ with all your heart, Right? And the fact that we don't all love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul shows us that we still have that sinful nature. Right? It shows us that we're incapable of ever being truly perfect here on earth. Right? So we desire to not sin. There's a heart of repentance. Right? And we need to all have that. And again, God hates sin. Right? He loves you, but he hates sin. And he is not okay with you continuing on in sin willingly. Right? So get right with the Lord today. Repent right? Fast. If there's some stuff going on in your life that you know that is just not pleasing to him and it breaks your heart, right? Fast. Take some time away from whatever, entertainment, food, right? Get deep into prayer. Show your remorse for the Lord, right? Repent of your sins, right? These things are pleasing to the Lord, okay? So I love you guys. Take this seriously, right? Take your salvation with fear and trembling, right? Because the Lord hate sin. It's detestable to him. Okay. And we need to have the same attitude towards it. And I love you guys and we'll see you guys next time.